All right, everybody. I think that we made it and are live, aside from our network deciding to be fussy right before we begin. So welcome to Guru 7, uh, session number 17. I'm Mark Coniglio, the creator of Isadora. I guess most of you know that. And today we're going to be looking at the Eyes++ Plus Plus actor. That's an actor that allows you to use a normal video camera, not a special connect or depth map camera like that, to do motion tracking. Okay? So um, let me just go over some of the stuff we always go over at the beginning of these sessions. First, if you have a question, please type at sign Troikatronics and then uh, type your question. That makes a nice big yellow highlight over there where I can see it and know that you are writing a question to me, especially since our good friend Lucas is not here to help today. So I'm really going to have to kind of go back and forth to pay attention, all right? Uh, I assume you're all subscribers to this channel, but if not, please go down there and hit the subscribe button. We'd love to have you with us. And um, also, if you have comments, you like the videos, please make those comments. Those sort of help us. As always, you can find out about these sessions on the Troikatronics forum, on Facebook, on our Facebook account, and our Instagram, all of which are listed, again, down in the description where you can find them, yeah? So uh, it's a big download today. It's a big file because there's a lot of... Uh, of uh, a movies in there. So make sure to go to the top of the chat and download the session materials if you haven't done so already because we're going to be going through those together. I prepared quite a few things for you today. I didn't even get as far as I might have liked to have gotten with this lesson, but um, it was good to have these clips because I think they'll help you if you start investigating this actor. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, and there's a new actor I made just a few days ago called Seek Target Value that I'm using in this patch and you need to install it. It's pretty easy if you just go to, there's a plug it, there's a folder there that says uh, install these, what did I say, plugins to install. And if you go into the folder for your platform, Macintosh or Windows, there's actually now just a shortcut or an alias and you should just be able to drag that um, drag that plugin right in there, but you need to restart Isadora. So if Isadora is open, you can quit Isadora briefly, drag that plugin in, and then restart Isadora so that it won't complain that the plugin is missing when you open your file, okay? So I think that's it. So now we can kind of dig in, yeah? So let me switch views here. Go over to Isadora. Make sure that you can see me. Yes, okay. And so there's a reminder at the beginning of the file. Install the seek target value actor. So it, it, the instructions are there if you need it. So do that. But while you're doing that, maybe I'll just go over this intro. It's all written out. Um, I'm not going to read it exactly, but just so you get to know what this actor is. So there's two actors, eyes and eyes plus plus. Eyes++ plus plus is the more sophisticated version of Eyes. Eyes is kind of simpler. The main advantage of Eyes++ plus plus is that it has various different ways to control the way it's tracking and capturing that image. And um, also it can track up to 16 objects at a time, whereas Eyes can only track one. Yeah. Um, and so the, really the thing that's so hard about motion tracking or doing this kind of tracking is that what the problem always is, is how do you separate the things you want to track from the background? I mean, imagine you want to track my hand right here, but I've got a face right behind it and some complex shapes and everything. How do I pick that hand out from the background? Yeah, that's always tricky. And there's some techniques that we're going to go through to learn how to kind of make that differentiation between the background and the, the objects you want to track, right? So that's going to be one of the things you'll find that's, that it takes the most work. And especially when you're in a real life situation in a real a theater or maybe even a public space where you're trying to track people, that's the tricky bit is how to really make that happen. And we'll see some ways to do that. The clips that I've prepared for you today mostly are pretty friendly that way because I did them on some pretty simple backgrounds to make it easy. Sorry, I have to move a window. Make it easy for you to kind of get something going. But we'll still learn how some different ways to make that happen, okay? All right, so, um, right, so we're gonna start with the idea of tracking just simple brightness because that's actually what eyes and eyes++ do. They look for the biggest and brightest thing in the frame 
and that's what it's going to track, right? So if there's three bright objects and it, you've told it to track only one, it's going to pick the biggest one. That's how it makes a decision. Which thing am I going to track, right? So um, as we go into the next section, um, you know, the things that we track, they actually, we call them blobs. And it sounds like a funny name, but actually, if you're a computer vision scientist, that's the technical term of the art of the thing that you're tracking is a blob, yeah? So if you look at the eyes actor here in this second scene, uh, intro three, you'll see that there's 16 blob outputs, one for each of the possible blobs that it might be able to track, yeah? And next to that is an actor called the blob decoder. We'll get into that in a second. But a blob is actually a collection of information. It's not just one thing. It's like several pieces of information. And there's so much in there that if we put all of them in the one actor, it would be sort of a mile high, right? So the blob decoder allows you to get the bits that you need. So if you only need one blob or two blobs, you just have a couple of those that you hook up to the actor, yeah? And that's how you get at the individual uh, no plugins folder find for Windows. Okay. The, sorry, interruption. All right. If you can't find the plugin folder uh, to um, uh, the Izzy file that should be open, should be Guru 17. It should be in there, I hope. Let me check that. Oh, motion tracking with eyes. Sorry, the copy. That was a backup. It's the motion tracking with eyes. That's the one you want to use. Okay. Sorry for that confusion. And let me go back to Isadora. Okay, if you don't find, if that link doesn't work, if you go into Isadora, into the help menu, and say open plugin folder, and then say Troikatronics actor plugins, Isadora will open the folder for you. And yeah, so, and then you'll put it in there. So see here on Windows, it's, a, it's actually a folder. The plugin is, is stored in a folder. Seek target value dot Izzy plug. It's called the same thing on Mac. And so the idea is that you would just drag that whole seek target value Izzy plug into that shortcut on Windows. But if that doesn't work, go to the help menu, say open plugin folder, Troikatronics actor plugins, and you can open that folder and then drop it in that way, okay? I hope that uh, solved that particular issue. I'm gonna keep moving forward as we go along, but thanks for asking. If it doesn't work, let me know. Maybe I can still help you from here, yeah? Okay, so yeah, so the blob decoder, that's where we were. We were accessing the individual properties of the, of the, diff, of the actor, of the blob, yeah? Okay, and then what I did for this tutorial, now, there's going to be a lot of things you'd have to sort of prepare and get ready and probably if you have your webcam on your computer that's actually not the optimum way to work with this you really want a camera that you can point somewhere and if it's always pointing at your face that makes trying to do this a little bit difficult so i've prepared movies for every example that you have in there that's why the download was kind of big and this i made a user actor called live video or movie it will default to taking the live input from your camera. But if you press the letter V, it'll play the movie that I've prepared. And that way you can try it without having to set up your webcam because that might be something you might want to do later when we've got, and you've got a little bit more time, you know, because if I can, I don't know, this is, I shouldn't do this probably, but I'll just show you, see like what I've got, I've got this webcam right here waiting to go to be able to track over there. It's on a nice tripod all set up, you know, pointed over at that empty area over there. That's a better way to work, yeah, okay? So, um, all right, so anyway, I just wanted to make it clear that when you really make a patch that's gonna use a live camera, probably you won't, you wouldn't have that live video or movie, that's for teaching you, but instead you would just have a video in Watcher. But that said, just to make sure that you've got a live camera, everyone should go to the input menu and say live capture settings and show this where we set up which camera we're going to work with and um, then you're going to choose whatever camera you want to use for tracking i'm going to uh i i'm going to use i'm going to attempt to use the same camera that's looking at me hopefully that will work okay without causing any trouble you should pick the camera here in device under video input that you want to use as an input, yeah? I also made sure to set that to a lower resolution. 
because you really for tracking you don't need a high resolution image in fact it's a little bit better if it's smaller because it's going to end up getting squashed anyway okay um, so uh, then once you've chosen that camera you can say start live capture and if everything's working okay you will get a thumbnail down below okay but like I said you don't need a webcam you don't even need this going right now because I have example movies for everything that we're about to do and now I just close that window yeah yeah you know what thank you for mentioning that bill and other people I'm just gonna insert here that uh, it's an important day it's Juneteenth it's the day that we celebrate the abolition of slavery although I learned by looking it up and reading about it today that it actually was abolished two and a half years before that but anyway it's a different story but given everything that's going on, you know, the job of artists is to seek justice, actually. To seek not justice and new knowledge. And I think that we're here to explore Isadora and the software, but I think all of us, when we're using this software, what we should be doing is seeking justice and fairness and equality for everyone. So I will acknowledge that day, and thank you, Bill, for actually putting it there. Yes, happy Juneteenth. Juneteenth. Let's go be artists and do what we do with that and make it happen, right? And let's learn. Those of us who need to learn, let's learn more about it. Okay. Thank you for letting me acknowledge that day and thank you for the reminder. Okay. Let's go. Let's get into this, okay? Now, just because we are, we are also in the time of Corona, I'm going to give this a shot. I don't know if this example will work because it was a little bit dodgy earlier. But since I, this is my mask that I wear everywhere when I go outside, as I hope that lots of you are doing, I hope you can still hear me. Yeah. So here we go. I'm going to go into this scene. And you can see that. Oh, I have it backwards. I hooked it up backwards somehow, but it doesn't matter. There you can see that this little purple area or pinkish purple area on my mask is being tracked by the eyes plus plus actor now so that's what we're going after here and somehow we're going to learn how in a minute I got this little area oh see I can even make it go up and down oh, 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 oh. A little animation and you know if also if I put these images together you can see it floating on top of me oh, oh, oh. yeah okay anyway it's tracking backwards up and down anyway my my little dot here so that's an example of motion tracking right it's really simple it's not doing something very interesting but it is successfully tracking me okay okay mask off we have plenty of social distance because we're on YouTube it's no problem but anyway I just thought that would be fun to show that because also my partner Annie made that amazing wonderful mask we have beautiful masks all right so that's where we're headed is going to do something like that Let's now actually get into it, yeah? Yeah, you know, I had a crash. And I had that happen once earlier today. That's something I will be looking into because I don't want that to happen to you. Sorry for that, but here we go again. Okay, so back to where we were. There. Okay, so there's the live image, right? But we're not going to work with the live image. Remember, here's this live video or movie actor that I made. And I'm going to hit letter V. And it's going to start playing a movie. And now you see a recording of my hand, yeah? Okay. Um, um, find the plugin into Mac OS X folder, but I can't open it on Windows. All right, well, it's not a disaster if you don't have this plugin. So if you don't have it or can't install it, don't, do, don't worry. Post in the forum about it. I don't have, I can't quite know, I can't quite feel what's going on with you here. So we'll sort it out later, okay? So this is an Eyes++ plus plus actor. It's got the signal coming from this movie of my hand, which I did on a dark background, yeah? And so there's some advice here in the first comment. It talks about the very first adjustment you want to make is how many objects are you going to track because you want to limit that to the actual number that you know will be the most because otherwise it might get confused and start tracking one that it, you don't know about and you're not getting the signal or not seeing it. So to keep it really simple to start with, I'm going to type one here where it says objects 
instead of 16, which is the default, I'm going to type 1. So now we want to track one object. But it's still not actually working. You see this red area in the monitor window? That shows you what Isadora is tracking. And you can see it's tracking the whole frame. Well, that's because this black background, if you look at it over here, if I zoom in even on that, yeah, it's not really black. It's kind of dark, but it's not truly black, right? So what we want to do, we want to set a threshold. We want to say, if it is below this level, we're going to pretend it's black, and everything above that, we're going to consider to be light or white. So that's this input right here, is the threshold. Yeah. Now watch me, if I, I'm going to zoom in a little bit because you can just see it on the monitor. Watch what happens as I increase this value. Going up, nothing's happening yet. Oh, some black is starting to appear. It's getting a little bit darker. And as I go up and up and up and up and up, oh, almost gone. And eventually, when I get to about 27 or 28, it has erased that darkish background and made it fully black, so now the only thing that it sees is my hand. And that is our first experiment of removing the background, of di distinguishing the thing we want to track from the background. Now again, this is kind of an optimum situation, right? But stretch your mind out as you see these examples, these simple examples I filmed here. Imagine instead of it being my hand, Imagine that there's a black marley floor and there's a camera in the ceiling and there's a bunch of dancers moving around on that floor. You could, for instance, have that camera pointing down and know their position on the stage, right? Because if there's enough contrast between that dark marley floor and those dancers standing up on top of it, you can pick them out and track them. But even this example is sort of nice because it's almost like being a conductor here. I can move my hand around and track it and I'm sensing certain properties about it. And to see those properties, we're going to look at the blob decoder. But before I do that, let's look actually at the monitor closely again, yeah? So you see this red box that's around the hand. There's a name for that in computer science or computer vision uh, science as well. That's called the bounding box. That is the the horizontal and vertical edge of the blob, right? So that bounding box encloses the thing you're tracking. And again, you want to set that threshold so that that box is really tight around the thing that you're tracking, right? And we've got that. It's working really well. Now, another thing you'll see in there, there's a little cross, and then there's also this dot, uh, all right? The, the square dot uh, the square dot is the center of the bounding box, right? That's always exactly halfway between the top and the bottom and the left and the right. But the cross is something else. That's called a centroid. That's a really technical sounding term also from computer vision. And to illustrate that, I want to play movie number one. I just went over here to live video and I changed it to this dancer movie. And I'm going to freeze Isadora at a certain point when it gets into a good spot here to illustrate this. Just going to let it go here. For like, no, that's not a good spot. Let's go a little bit more. This is my dear friend, Katarina Eva Lancy, who is our dancer on film today. Here comes it, there. Now there, if you look at it, the bounding box square uh, dot is right in the center of the bounding box. But this cross is off to the side because what it's doing is it's using the brightness of the blob because see it's there's a lot of black in there right whoops there's a lot of black in there if you look inside here this whole area to the um, you know to my right is is black so it's using the brightness of the blob to make a guess of where the actual center of the object is right so this centroid is an estimation based on the brightness of the pixels and you know how it is kind of offset like with her arm out like that, it's making a guess. The center of the object is not in the center of the bounding box, but off to the left, right? So that's what the centroid is. And now that we've looked at that, we can go over here and we can look at the blob decoder because you'll see all of the things I just talked about basically are there, plus one more. The bound center H and bound center V, the horizontal and vertical center of the bounding box, that's most often maybe what you're going to use, and that's coming out in those two outputs. That centroid, the little cross, is coming out in the centroid H and V, okay? That will not always match the center of the bounding box, as you just saw. 
Then there's the object width and the object height. So that's the width of the bounding box and the height of the bounding box. And one final thing you've got there is the object velocity. Basically, if you took a look at that uh, the center of the bounding box, how fast is that point moving in space? That's a measurement of velocity. Now I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to switch to movie number two, which was the one we started with of my hand, right? So now that we've got that, and you see on the second stage there, which is a virtual stage I made just for being able to visualize the output, I've just got a square and it's following the position of my hand, but you see it's doing a really good job of that, right? And in general, it looks pretty solid and pretty smooth. You might notice that it's not so smooth, right? It might be kind of jittery. If there's a little bit of darkness in the image, it might shiver, uh, sh you know, move back and forth a little. If you need to, you can go to the um, smoothing input of this actor and turn that up to something like 0.7 or 0.8 usually is what I use. And that will smooth out the values so that if there's any little jitter in it because of mistracking, because of the way the camera's seeing it, it will solve that problem, right? Okay, let me just look if there's any questions. Um, I'm seeing what my webcam sees even though my dance, because did you hit letter V? You have to hit letter V to switch to the, um, uh, to switch to the movie. Letter V is what it toggles. You see over here on this live video or movie, if the output says movie, it's playing the movie. If I hit letter V, it's now the camera. And if I hit letter V again, it's now the movie. That's how you switch. Let me know if that solved your problem. Um, how do you get the stage for the virtual stage to show up? Um, I'm sorry, I try to always be good about that. Basically, when you start the pro program, you're like this, and you choose, you wanna choose force stage preview. Yeah? Okay. Okay, force stage preview. Autumn's already answering the question. Thank you, Autumn. Okay, sorry if I'm missing it. Somehow the, yeah, if you misspell Troikatronics, I don't see the, the yellow thing, so try and spell it right. I know it's kind of a long word, but okay. I'll continue to watch over here and see if you're okay. Like I said, we're without our good friend Lucas today to help us help you along with things like that. So I'm kind of doing double duty today. All right. So the other thing that we're doing here is that we're taking the object velocity through a limit scale value actor. Now, we've covered this in other guru sessions and in our tutorials, but just to say it shortly, the limit scale value takes this very tiny range. You notice this velocity is actually very small, right? And it scales it up. We say the smallest we're gonna see is zero, the biggest is 0.15, and we wanna scale that to an output range of 50 to 100. And that is controlling the brightness of the square. So you'll see when I actually move my hand left or right quickly, that will brighten up a little bit, yeah? So hopefully that's working for you too. Now I added a couple of other things to this just to let you see. If you hit letter A now, you'll just get some crosshairs and the crosshairs are just representing exactly what's in the movie. That's showing you the center of the bounding box, yeah? And one additional thing is I, if you hit letter S, you'll see the centroid, right? So you can kind of see where that you know, where that offset is of the centroid. Of course, the hand is pretty much like a block, so it's never far off of the thing. But if I switch again to that movie of the dancer, you'll see that that centroid moves around much more as whenever her body gets where it's not symmetrical anymore, you'll see that centroid move around trying to make an estimation of where the center of the body is, right? So that that's the basic introduction. That's the data that you can get from this uh, eyes plus plus is th these things. The bounding box center, horizontal vertical, the centroid, horizontal vertical, the object width and height, and the velocity. Now from that point, you have to figure out what you're gonna do with that data, right? Oh yeah, one other important thing I didn't mention. Um, this tracking indicator, if I go back to the hand for a second, movie number two, you'll see that when my hand leaves the frame, I'm gonna reset the movie to the beginning. Watch this tracking number here. It says one, but when my hand is out of the frame, 
it says zero because it doesn't have anything to track. So that tracking output tells you if there's actually a blob present for that blob decoder. Yeah? Okay. All right. So that's our intro. You don't really need to, you can look at these uh, shapes and lines actors. You know, I just did that to give you a nice visualization of what's going on. But in the end, you have to think about what you're going to do with those numbers. I've got a couple of examples. They're not the most amazing art ever made, but there's a few examples in here of actually using those to do something a little bit creative, right? Now, there's a whole lot of inputs here in the eyes plus plus actor that um, I'm going to kind of try to mention as we go along. I have covered the most important ones. The uh, well, except for two, right? They have to come back. The number of objects, the smoothing, and um, the threshold, right? But actually, one other really important thing is this horizontal and vertical resolution. Now, if you tried to take a full HD resolution movie and do this algorithm for this tracking, it would be so slow, it would be completely unusable. We need to scale it down to a more manageable size. So it's important that when you set those inputs, that they are actually in the same aspect ratio of your video, right? It doesn't just automatically do a percentage. You have to sort of say, what, how many pixels across do I, do I want and how many pixels down? If you have a 16 by nine video, 120 by 68 is a great choice. 120 pixels by 68 down, that's a great choice to start with. If it was four by three, we would set this to 120 by 90 and you see the monitor window change. But I'm gonna put it back to 68. Every example in here is set to that, is to 120 by 68, which is 16 by nine ratio. Um, hopefully you know how to ca uh, calculate aspect ratios. But if you don't, we can kind of talk about that more in the forum. But for now, since most people probably have a 16 by nine input and all the movies I gave you are 16 by nine, then all of these are set to 120 by 68, yeah? Okay, there's a few other things though that come up later and we're not gonna encounter them because I have very clean movies for you, but just so you know what they are, the median filter and the blur amount. The median filter gets rid of speckles of noise in the video signal. If you've got a noisy video signal because maybe it's dark, turn the median filter on and this will kind of erase. You can see that even the fingers, in the corners of the fingers, it almost looks like I have webbed fingers now because of that median filter. It kind of softens the edges and gets rid of those extra pixels. You can also try, sometimes it's helpful to blur the image See, I'm turning up this blur and I lose the edges so it's not as accurate, but sometimes if you've got noise in the signal, blurring the image can help, right? So that's what the blur amount and median filter are for. We're not using that anywhere in this because we've got nice clean video, right? But that's something for you to know about are those two inputs. Now, this histogram thing is something I made for a piece, it's actually probably not generally useful. I'm not gonna get into it right now because I actually had to remember what it was for because I made it years and years and years ago and I didn't remember. Bounds track, also experimental, tries to turn one, um, one uh, image into four parts like it's a body. Totally experimental for a piece I made, don't use it. I should get these things out of there someday, I suppose. We'll hit the other ones below here in a little bit, but those are the ones I was gonna mention at the outset just so you knew about it. All right, let me check the questions in case anything's came up. Nope, everything's okay so far. Let me make sure YouTube is still not showing me a spinning thing, which means it's stopped telling me what you're saying. All right, um, so position tracking, right? Now we did this simple representation of it. Let's go to the next scene, which is brightness tracking with a bounding box. So I'm gonna now hit letter V again to play the movie. And now this is playing the nice movie of the dancer. And this is just a simple patch where I made a user actor that will, um, uh, uh, that will give you the um, bounding box around the dancer. So that's exactly what you see in the monitor window, um, except that you know now I've just made it so it's an, a thing you can actually visualize in Isadora. Again, if I put that bounding box on the dancer herself by changing the stage on this projector, 
you can see that it's following the edge of her body uh, very well. Yeah? Okay. So that's this little bounding box example. So if you wanted to use that in some way, you could, right? But let's actually get into, um, oh, well, let me just actually explain it briefly. Basically what I'm doing is I've got the bounding box center, horizontal, vertical, and I have the object width and height. By using all of those four values, I can calculate the four edges, and then I can make a shapes actor that makes that bounding box. And why did I put it inside of this um, user actor called make synced bounding box, and why does it have a video input? Because to make sure that no matter what the aspect ratio of your video is, that it puts that bounding box in the right place, it needs to know the aspect ratio of the source video, whether it's from a camera or a movie. So by taking the video, from this here, we take it up in this wire and over here, that allows this user actor to measure the resolution of the video. In fact, I'll show it to you. I double click here, see this get video size. Then it does some math and some divisions and some nasty stuff to make it all work. And if you just want to have that bounding box appear like this, this will, little actor will do it for you so you don't have to do it again, okay? Someone type a comment over there because I haven't seen one for a while and it makes me nervous that it's not working anymore. So if you, if you, if just someone say howdy over there so I know that the chat is still working. All right. All right. So now let's get into actually using this data in some kind of meaningful way. Okay. So if you go to the next scene and I'm going to turn up my volume here so you can see, hear this. Right. And, um, so I am going to go hit letter V for the movie. And if you hit letter V, okay, it worked, woo! I'm excited. All right, I'll let you. Okay, so I'm gonna turn that down a little bit. So you should be able to hear exactly what I'm hearing here if you're playing that movie, right? So um, here we've got the same bounding box thing we had before, but then I just added over here a little sound actor, right? And I'm just gonna add another actor so I can scooch this over here so you can see it. Okay, so I'm doing two things. I am controlling the speed of playback with the horizontal center, right? So the horizontal center of the bounding box speeds up and slows down the sound playback, right? That goes down here. You can see the speed. And then, as we did before, I'm taking the velocity using a limit scale value to scale 0 to 0.15 up to 0 to 100, and then I'm actually running that through a smoother actor to make it so it doesn't be so like shaky. We don't want it to be shaky like this, but like this. And we take that into the volume of the sound. Yeah. So here we have a very simple little hand gesture sound controller. Now there's all kinds of things you could do to make this even more interesting. You could start using the vertical position for something, right? Maybe we would use the vertical position um, for the volume, um, for the speed and use the horizontal position for the pan or there's other manipulations of sound. It could be a video playing too, right? Like for instance, I can take the same thing that's controlling the volume and I can go into the intensity of this projector and now the bounding box brightness that you see in down here in the second video is being controlled by the, the speed, right? So, you know, this gets into the thing that I always say when I get to this point when we're getting data. A number is a number is a number is a number, right? And um, uh, uh, so, and I see here that my, it looks like my video is really delayed into OBS. If you're seeing my voice really out of sync with my mouth, let me know and I'll see if I can do something about that. Maybe I should stop my live capture. Maybe that will help. Um, anyway, so that's the kind of thing that you can do. 
And that's kind of another topic in a way, like how do we use those numbers? What do we do with them? And we've covered some of this in the data tutorials, other tutorials. I think that one of the guru sessions I should do, I did a, a thing at the Isidora Werkstatt called what do we do with the data? And I think it would be good to do that basically as a guru session. And um, so we'll do that for a future time. But this is one small example of what you might want to do, right? Now, going into the next scene, I just wanted to show another simple example, which is tracking the darkest thing in the frame, right? Normally we track the brightest thing. Um, and uh, so I'm going to hit letter V, and now we have a different movie. And here we have a hand with a black glove on, an, on a light-colored floor, and we are tracking the darkest thing in the frame. That's really simple to arrange. All you have to do is turn on the inverse setting. Yeah? So it basically, that just inverts the video, makes the dark stuff light and the light stuff dark. And so now you can see, just like we had before with the hand, we've got a nice bounding box around this white hand because the black glove is being made white and the dark floor. And again, if I, the threshold's quite high here. See, here's what it looks like until I start turning up the threshold, threshold, threshold until we get that nice bounding box um, and um, tracking, you know, around the, the hand, yeah? So if, you know, we, I said it was tracking the brightest thing in the frame, but if you turn that invert, inverse input on, now it's tracking the darkest thing in the frame. So it just reverses the process. Everything else about it is exactly the same, okay? Um, okay, good. Glad to hear it's back in sync. Yeah, I think it's because of trying to capture from the same camera. All right. Everyone okay? Questions? Let's take a breath. Let's take a... <sighs> take a breath. Data breath. Yeah, it's like, what do we do with the data? You can sort of think about that. You can tell me if you have an idea of what you might like to do with your eyes module. If you have a project in mind, something you'd like to know about, post it now. Maybe I can try and actually do it if I'm brave enough to do that for you, okay? So, yeah, so, all right. The basics of getting it working, I think we're working. But let's take one more look at another patch that, ah, oh, see? That's happened to me a few times. Hmm. Sorry for those crashes. I hope that's not happening to you. All right. Uh, so here, in the scene called Bounding Box Duet, now we have something different because I have set the number of objects to two. And then you can be in this scene too and try it. So uh, here I've got my two hands going into the frame, right? And now we've got two bounding boxes. Glad to hear no crashing. Oh, that's good. Maybe it's just me. I also, you know, I have so much crazy stuff installed on this computer. It, you know, the development computer is not. Um, Okay. Okay. Manipulate ropes from the 3D session. We won't be able to do pull that off today, but you absolutely could do that. So two objects and it's really working, but let's watch closely in the monitor window for a second. Now, when it's that single hand coming in, here's the beginning of the movie. It's all cool, right? All fine. But as, and the second hand comes in and as long as it's not, as it's, you know, separate, it's also cool. But watch what happens. They're going to cross over right there. Do you see what happened? The two hands crossed over. There's no way to tell one from the other. In fact, there is only one blob right now, the red one, which means blob number one. In a moment, when I unfreeze Isadora, you'll see that as soon as they separate, they change back. And luckily, it happened to be in the same orientation. But this is another, here's another heavy uh, computer vision term for you. That's called occlusion. Yeah? When something blocks one something else, and this happens in all kinds of systems, like the ones with the markers all over your body and Hollywood and all that kind of stuff, right? So, um, so this is going to happen. And so one thing, if you're using eyes as a tracking mechanism to look at multiple, whether it's dancers or bodies in a space or whatever, this problem of occlusion, what you have to be basically okay with is these two things can switch positions. Like the red one can become the green one if they briefly occlude each other and then separate again. There is no, <clears throat> excuse me, there's no 
100% sure way to know that those objects are going to maintain their their position it's just not possible with this kind of tracking okay so but if we let it go uh what you can see i've done here i took the same thing i did before with the sound and against i've just got two of them and i've got two different sounds one hand is controlling one sound and another hand is controlling the other Yeah. So now we have this possibility of tracking two hands, but that's the thing I really wanted to bring to your, to kind of bring to your awareness is that you cannot really depend, uh, unless you can be sure these things will never touch each other. You cannot depend that they, if they cross each other, that they won't swap positions, right? But that said, if you can make that allowance and make that work, then it can work for you and you can really have a system that tracks multiple objects using a normal camera. And all we did here really was set the number of objects to two. You wouldn't want to set it to four. I want to show you why. I'm going to set it to four. What will happen is you'll start seeing colors other than red and green here because it's choosing now yellow is blob three and blue is blob four or something like that. So now see it's tracking a blob but neither of the blob decoders are moving because it's actually blob three, not blob one or two, right? That's what that color tells you, right? Now there's blob uh, two, the green one is working. And now we have, you see, it's getting all mixed up. So you really want to set that number of objects to match the number of objects that you really are going to track, right? To make that really work, yeah? Okay, but another important, a setting that could be important and the defaults for this are generally pretty good, are the same max dist, meaning distance, and the same area change. What does that mean? Well, what it's looking at, there's two things it's looking at there. It's looking at how far did it go and how much did the size of it change. If, if it's tracking multiple objects and the amount of movement is too big or the amount of change of size is too big, it goes, oh, well, that can't possibly be the same object. I'm going to push it into a new object, right? Now, if we have two hands here, this is a very controlled situation. It's actually just going to work because we said it's two objects, right? But if we say that we want four, maybe to make that work better, we want to make that same maximum distance and same area change bigger. In other words, we say, okay, it might really change a lot, but we don't want it to change the object number, the blob number. So I'm going to set those temporarily to 50 and 50. And I'm going to wait now for the other hand to come in. We've got the red one. And let's see what it chooses next. The green one. Uh, see, that's actually worse. It's getting more confused, I think. Well, I, again, the best thing to do is to simply have the right number of objects for the things you're going to track because then it's going to work much more dependably. But, and these are numbers you just have to experiment with. It's kind of tricky. But it does what it's all about. The same max distance and same area change is about trying to keep those numbers the same, like to understand what object is what object and really know if it's a new one or one that was already there before, right? But these numbers I've given you in here are pretty good for your general circumstances. So that's what you can use for those. But that's just to introduce those because when you're tracking multiple objects, that's what you would um, really need, one of the things you need to adjust. The lifespan thing, that's another thing. It's like if a thing leaves the frame, how long does it survive before it dies off? Probably that also doesn't is not so helpful. You can mess around with it. Um, I did that also as kind of an experiment, but in fact, really, I just usually, for most things, you just set the lifespan to zero, right? So again, if, if these advanced sort of parameters that I'm talking about don't make sense to you and you don't want to mess around with it, use what I've given you because it's really all set up pretty well and it should do the job that you need it to do, right? Um, but if you're curious about those, we can look at them. But one last thing I'll look at in this section, the min height, a min width and min height, that's the, as a percentage, what is the smallest thing I'll track? Watch what happens if I set this to 50 and 50. 
It doesn't track anything anymore because it needs to be at 50% of the size of the frame and neither of the hands are that big. But if I set it to 20 and 20, it sometimes tracks, but it's not always big enough. But 10 and 10 is good. Why do you use that? If you've got a little bit of, of, smut, of schmutz, let's say, in the frame, things that you don't want to track, little things, little dots and things from that, this will help you ignore those, right? It will just say, those are too small, those can't be an object, I won't track it. So that input can be very useful. Again, if you're in a situation where you've got some noise in the signal, this min width and min height, setting that up to really just get the things that you want, that can be super helpful, okay? All right. Yeah, okay, sorry for the, the crashes. I'm gonna look into that right away because I did not know about that issue. Okay, um, so to give you a, a sort of a example, let's go to the next scene, bounding particles. Oh, by the way, if you're having that crash, I did look into it briefly today. Turn off the monitor in the Eyes++ actor. It has something to do with that. It's something about drawing that monitor image that is causing that and actually once you've got your patch set up and you're just running your show you don't need that and it just produces another small burden of things to do for the computer so if you have that experience and I apologize for you I always hate it when I see a crash uh, for any of you but if that happens then turn the monitor off and I, I'm very I feel quite certain that it won't happen okay but I will be looking into that because that troubled me today all right Here's an example, if we go to the brightness tracking, bounding particles, maybe uh, Ziggy, I know you wanted the ropes, but at least here's some particle system. If you hit letter V, uh, we'll have Katerina here moving for us, as you can see, and I just made these particle systems that are coming from the corners of the bounding box. You can't see the bounding box around her, but these particles are being generated from the corners of the bounding box, and the velocity of how fast she's moving at those corners controls the brightness of the particles, right? Which gives a little bit of life. So it's very symmetrical. It doesn't, you know, follow her limbs like a tracking camera does. But since they're kind of going off into the distance, it makes a beautiful image. Yeah, it's not bad. And you can also play with this a little bit. Some, one of the inputs on this actor is the object scale H and V. I'm going to turn this up really high where it says 10 in each of these. I'm going to turn it to 200. You see what happens. And now they got really tall, right? That gives you kind of a different sort of a look. Yeah. So you can play around with those settings if you want. But that was just to show something that is... Um, uh, <laughs> just a video schmutz. Um, there's something coming from, from these actors and using those values. But, you know, if you look into that user actor, see the key here is that I'm using the 2D velocity actor to measure the movement, the speed of movement of the corner. And then I'm using a smoother to smooth that out. And you can see here I'm affecting the color that is being used to generate the particles based on the velocity. So, you know, this is what you always want to do with interactive stuff. If you're going to make systems that measure people's movement, you want to measure the inflection of what they're doing. That's one of the things we would cover in what do you do with the data. What is the inflection? What little gesture and what little subtlety can they give to that movement that you can measure and impose that measurement on a quality of a sound or a visual so that their movement is really inflecting what we see, so that they are truly in control of the image, of that they're making it, just as the musician would make a sound on an instrument, yeah? Okay, so there's a little example with that. All right, so that is, um, that is uh, tracking with eyes and doing it with brightness only. We spent the whole hour on that. But the rest of the concepts are really the same. It's not gonna take too much longer to go through the rest. But I wanted to show you one other technique that can be really useful, which is to now track color, okay? Let's well, another deep breath, you know, and take a moment. Questions can come while we're taking a deep breath. Finding our center, making sure that we have a nice alignment so that we can think properly, yeah? 
I'm just filling a little bit while you have a chance to type any urgent questions that you have. Please say schmutz again. I'm happy to say schmutz. Schmutz, yeah. I had a wonderful uh, uh, couple, this older Jewish uh, couple that were my landlords in Los Angeles years and years ago. That's the first time I heard the word schmutz because I had schmutz on my porch and she was telling me to clean it up, right? Okay. Um, all right. All right, everything's cool, no questions. I think we're good for the moment then. Let's get into this color tracking. All right, this is a completely unhooked up patch so that you can do it with me if you want. You can do this with your camera if you happen to have maybe a colored object. Now see here, I have a couple of colored objects. I didn't tell you to do this in advance, I'm sorry. You know, I can also use my coffee cup, but it should be a nice, bright, pure color. See how pure and bright these colors are? Really, really nice, yeah? So you can use something like that, or you can just play the movie, because if you hit the letter V, it'll play a movie. I'm actually going to play the movie, because I think that's easiest. We can all do the same thing, and you can follow along, because there's a little bit to understanding this about using the chroma key actor that I want to show you, okay? So first step, take the live video or movie and connect it to the top input of the chroma key actor, and then connect the output of that chroma key actor to the projector. Yeah, and there you see a pretty icky looking video with a lot of noisy black in it and you see a couple of hands there, right? But maybe you can pick out the yellow and the blue. Those are actually, oh I should have grabbed them before, um, a couple of like almost uh, cartoon rings that any made. Yeah, very, very beautiful, right? Like this. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're seeing in the video. And we chose those because they're a nice, nice, bright, saturated color. That's one thing that makes this really work well, yeah? So our goal here, remember, the goal of motion tracking is always, how do we separate the thing we want to track from the background? And then this time, instead of using brightness, we're going to use color. So normally, the chroma key actor removes the color that it matches. It matches a color that says, like right now it's trying to look for red, the floor is kind of pinkish woody something, and it's subtracting that red from it, right? But instead, we want to do the reverse. We want to keep the color we match and erase everything else, okay? To make that happen, the first very important step, you cannot forget, take the inverse input of the chroma key actor and turn it on. So now it's going to do the reverse process. It's going to get rid of the, the colors that don't match and leave the one that does. Next step, then you go to the key hue and you start sliding it until there. Oops, fine adjustment. I'll click in the number here. Until the only thing you see is the color that you are want to track, which is the yellow ring right? Probably it'll be the same number for you. I'm using 9.5. Okay? So great. It works, right? Now, the key, the hue width, now that's something else. That's saying, how wide a range of colors will I accept? You should not adjust this number unless you really have to. And I will try and show you with the other camera a situation where you would have to. Normally 5% is a good amount. But you can open it up a little bit if you want. If you're finding that when you change the angle, I'll show you. It's like, see this blue? Look at the, if you look at the live feed of me, see as I turn it, it got much wider as it faced towards the window where the sun is. And over here, it's darker. And so that's a place where maybe you need to open up that hue width. Really do it with restraint, though. If you do this, whoops, wrong. If you do this, and you turn that hue width, you see it's like getting an entire rainbow of colors in there. That's not what you want. That is not what you want. So try 5%. The saturation thing is how pure does the color have to be? The lower that number, the closer it can be to white. And you'll see that if you start going down towards zero, that, well, still matching it pretty well. Basically, you want to turn that number up as high as you can, but you can see right now as I turn that up, sometimes the center of the ring turns black because it gets lighter as it's facing the light. So 
20 is a pretty good setting. You just have to try it. But the key, you've got to get the hue right. Then you can mess around with the other ones, remembering that 5 is the default for hue width and 20 is the default for saturation. But as you can see now, we've got a great tracking on this, this yellow ring. And that means we can take it right into eyes and voila, you see that it is tracking that ring, right? It's tiny, but it's in there. It's tracking it just fine, yeah? Okay? So once you've got that, now you can take the live video or movie output into the second chroma key actor, yeah? This time we'll also remember to turn the inverse input on. And now we have to go looking for the blue ring, changing the key hue until we see that blue ring. Oops, I'm sorry, I forgot a step. You have to also connect it to the projector so you can see it. Whoops, wrong one. Connect the output of the chroma key to the projector so you can see it. By the way, I meant to do this at the beginning too. I have a projector down here that allows you to see um, to see darker, but to see the image. Here's what it really looks like, right? That's the actual source image, right, that we're looking at. All right, but if you look at the top stage here, we're trying to find the blue ring. So now I keep going with the key hue, keep going, keep going, up and up and up, getting more towards blue. Oh, I missed it. Oh, it's there, sort of. I'm going to take the saturation down a little bit. Hmm. Where are you, blue ring? Whoops, there it was. All right. It's a little dark, the ring, so you might not notice it, but yeah, there it is. I don't know if you can see it very well, but it's kind of dark in the image, but it's there, right? Um, it's just that the blue is darker than the yellow. But that doesn't matter. As long as it's brighter than black, we can now feed that into the eyes plus plus actor and it's going to track that blue ring yeah set the threshold of that lower you can actually set the threshold down to one i forgot to say that because we're removing all the background and everything and all that's left is the one color we should have these i should have done this when i sent the patch this is very important set the threshold of both eyes actor to one because they absolutely, once you do this subtraction of the, of the background, everything else is going to be pure black and it, it'll still work, right? So you can see there that we are tracking both objects. Did you notice here, though, that I set the min width and min height? I'm going to even set that to min width of one and min height of one for both of these. Because they're pretty small, right? The little objects are pretty small in the frame and to make sure that it tracks them all the time, we want to set that minimum width to a small number. But as you can see, it's now tracking that. And what I was going to show you before, if I set this video, the source video, to pretty dark, 50%, now I put it in the same frame as here, you can see how it emphasizes the thing that it's tracking, right? That's sort of a nice way of visualizing what it's doing, right? Now, you may not, that's also a great little tutorial on how to separate something by color. But the point of this is that we are using two eyes plus plus actor. And the reason this is great is because even if the hands cross over, even if one of them is obscured briefly, and you can see this because the hands do cross over from time to time, we never lose track of which one is which, right? That's the big advantage of this system, is that we always know which blob is which, and we will never make a mistake. You'll never see them swap, because it's based on the color of the object itself, right? So that's the reason this color tracking can be useful. Of course, the downside is you need really, really brightly colored objects to be able to track it, and that may be for the dramaturgy of whatever it is you're doing, not be optimum. So. You just have to sort of roll with that and see what works, right? I mean, I think that the main thing is that um, you, uh, you know, that you think about the dramaturgy of it. Like I said, like there was a wonderful piece I saw many, many years ago in the early days of dance and technology stuff where the set was white, the dancers were dressed in white, everything was white, white, white. It was just a huge white stage, really. And there was one dancer with a red hand and a red glove, and they were tracking that one red hand. And it was very very um, beautiful, symbolic way that they were using that color red in, inside of that entire universe of white that we were watching, right? 
So that was a case where I saw this work because that's exactly what they were doing. They were using a color, a chroma key to track that red hand, right? Okay. So, so that's basically how you do it. Now is a great time about this color tracking to ask a question. I have a small, um, how about reflective tape for brightness? That could very possibly work. That could especially work if you're using infrared light, which I'm going to talk about at the end. I can't demonstrate using infrared light. I don't have the gear with me here to do it. But yes, that is possible. And you know, if you got this kind of tape like they used on the swords in the original Star Wars, this highly reflective tape that always sends the brightness back out kind of in the same direction that it enters the thing and makes it really, really bright. Of course, that's going to be in your audience's eyes too, right? If it's visible light, but if it's infrared light, that's the beauty of it. You can shoot a lot of it at the stage and our eyes can't see it. It's out of the range of seeing. So reflective tape is a possibility, right? Also, um, any kind of light source that stands out and can be brighter than anything else on the stage could also be used for tracking. It kind of all depends on what it is you're up to and what the situation is. Of course, if you are using Eyes++ for some kind of installation piece, then maybe that's not, um, that's not the, the optimum thing because you, you can't ask people to, you know, if they're walking through a public space, you're going to ask them to put on a red hat to be able to be tracked or even to put the reflective tape on, right? So that's one thing about it, right? So here's a small um, example of the color tracking um, in action here. And uh, if I hit the video link, and I just took that same particle system that I took before, and I just moved it over here. So now it's tracking the particles on the rings, and you see what's happening, yeah? Let's do that full screen for a second. Enjoy that. There's no sound for this, just the, the particle systems following the rings. But you see it does a really nice job. And it's because it's adjusting the brightness based on the velocity, you even get a kind of sense of widening out of the, of the streams as the thing. Oh, she made a heart. How beautiful. Yes. OK, so there's just one little example of using that. But really, again, it comes down to, how do you use the data? What are you going to do with that information, right? It's all numbers. Everything in Isadora is numbers. You can control it all. Anything that takes a number as an input can be controlled by this information, yeah? All right. There is one final technique that I want to show you about that is very interesting, but also somewhat problematic, OK? But I want to show it to you anyway, um, uh, because it has, it has one great advantage. To do this. I'm going to, that camera I showed you earlier, which is actually an Orbrac Astra, which is a depth camera, but it has an RGB camera on it, right? So I'm going to set that up and I'm going to start the live capture and hopefully you will see the couch. Yes, there's the couch. All right. And um, uh, so that's a complicated background, right? And there is no way that we can use brightness or darkness. We have bright stuff and we have dark stuff. Um, so, um, uh, you know, this is a problematic background. What do we do with that? This technique is called background subtraction. The, the problem with it is, is that you have to be able to get a picture of that background with nothing in it for this to work, right? But this is what we're going to do. We use the freeze actor to, when we hit the letter G for grab, it's going to grab a still frame. So I'm going to do that when nothing is in the frame. If you're doing this at home and you're using your webcam, you got to like duck all the way out of your frame when you press that button or this will not work. Yeah. If you're in the frame at all, it's not going to work. Right. And you can see that if I hit letter G here, if I hit letter G with my hand in the frame, yeah, you see what happens, right? Okay. It doesn't work, right? You need to be out of the frame. But if I hit letter G, because did you notice before, let me leave the scene and come back, right? So, well, it actually works. Okay, so it's black over there, but if I, no, I can't show you. All right, anyway, we grab the background, right? We get this still picture, yeah? And then if we take this actor called the effect mixer, we take that frozen background, you see this connection here, see this connection coming from freeze to the second input, 
but the live signal from the camera is going into video in one and it subtracts the two and when you subtract the two if they're both the same it's like one minus one is zero or four minus four is zero you get black but if they're different you will see something brighter than black now I have to go over there to show you because I'm gonna do that so excuse me but watch in the image there and you'll see that yeah that I in fact am appearing in the image right you see my outline yeah okay so now so that we can all experiment without me leaving the, the scene there, um, I made a movie of this too. So here's, if you press letter, uh, yeah, what you have to do is you have to press letter V, but you have to make sure and grab the frame when I'm not there. Here's me doing my incredible dance piece. Now, I'm out of the frame. Now, click the letter G, because if you do it when I'm out of the frame, it will snap that background and you can see at least where the wall is, not so good with the couch, but it's tracking me really well, that upper part of my body, right? It's all about contrast. You need something that is different, uh, a different color from the background than the foreground, right? So, um, so this background te technique is, is great, but I wanna go back to the live camera for a second. I'm gonna snap the background. Here are some of the things you gotta worry about with this. It works great as long as nothing in the background is moving and nothing, the camera isn't moving. But here, look what happens if I bump the camera. Whoops, uh-oh, I bumped, I just tilted it actually, but now that I bumped it or I like did like this, it's never gonna line up again and now I have stuff that I'm tracking when I shouldn't be tracking anything. The background can't move and the camera can't move, right? That's a limitation. I'm going to snap the background again. Now it's fine again because I snapped the background again, right? So, um, but the other thing that can be problematic, and maybe you noticed it because it's gotten darker in here since I set this up and it's reacting a little bit more. Can you see the whole image get brighter when I go into the frame? See that? See how the, see how the, the white wall is actually showing up? but as soon as I leave the frame, it kind of goes away again. That is a result of the auto exposure on the camera adjusting because my black shirt or dark shirt is covering the white wall and now it's taking the exposure down, down uh, up because the image is darker, right? Okay, that's a problem too and something that you have to watch out for. I went today and I actually invested in a piece of software because on Mac OS, on Windows, there's lots of things to do this, and I think most of them are free. But I did not find a free uh, thing to deal with this. But I found this free uh, this uh, app for eight dollars or eight pounds or whatever, uh, eight euros, I guess. Um, um, it's called Webcam Settings. I got this from the App Store, and this is the one of the. It's very nice. It's worth the money, I think, because what it allows you to do. Can you see here? The webcam that's doing my, my face for the broadcast is set to manual exposure. It doesn't work for all cameras, like the internal webcam on the Apple, nothing. You can't control anything. But for the Astra camera, the depth camera, I have all of these controls, but I do not have, again, the um, manual exposure. But for the, uh, uh, eight, the, the Logitech C920, we have the choice for manual exposure here. That's what you would want to use if you were going to use this background subtraction technique. Either have a high quality camera that allows you to turn the auto exposure off or a webcam that can work with per this software, for instance, to allow you to turn the auto exposure off because that will also foul up the algorithm, right? And um, so uh, basically, that is the combination. That's why it's kind of a bit more tricky. Can't move the camera, the background can't move, and we really need the auto exposure off. It doesn't work well if the camera's making the image get brighter all, and darker all the time because that subtraction ceases to work well. But when it does work well, which it was doing earlier, even with the, the this was done with a camera that did not have the auto exposure. If I play that movie, oh, I have to start from the beginning again, hold on. 
Okay, you'll see that same musical thing that we did earlier is working. Yeah? Even on that complex, even on that complex background, I'm able to, and even sitting down, it's still seeing the top part of my body there. Yeah, it gets a little freaked out at the edge there, right? There's my bow, so it's over, okay? So that's an example of the kind of thing you can do with the background subtraction. Now, this is technique is useful not just with visual cameras, but also with infrared. When <coughs> Excuse me. When Troika Ranch did the P16 Revolutions, which used all kinds of infrared tracking, because we had this set piece that had all these waves in it at the top of the stage and it would get picked up by the infrared light, I also used background subtraction to make sure those waves didn't show up, that they showed up as black. So even with infrared light, this is actually a technique that is useful. I see a few questions there. Uh, is it webcam settings or webcam settings control? I think it's just called webcam settings. It says here's about webcam settings. Does it give me an about box somewhere? I don't know. I don't know where it is, but I'm pretty sure it's just called webcam settings. Yeah, that's. I think that's the name of the program. Uh, there aren't a lot of apps that do this. I guess it was a trick to get it to work. Yeah. So anyway, oh there it is. Webcam settings. Yeah, that's the name of the app. It's on the App Store. Well, like I said, it was eight, uh, eight euros. Um, yeah. So um, Graham Sculpture, our good friend Sculpture Graham, is saying, I find a camera slightly out of focus can help, especially the older CCTV cameras, analog ones, for example. That's why, too, this thing of like using the built-in blur to um, blur it you can either blur it by making it a bit out of focus or you can make it uh, blurred a little bit by turning the blur amount to one inside of the eyes plus plus you can try it that way as well yeah just depends on what's happening with the image but that's a great um, uh, that's a great uh, suggestion that's a great thing to notice Graham did the the really the first tutorials ever on this topic and did a great job you can still look at his tutorials which have been around forever because they're still totally valuable you can find those on the web so I think or Graham put a link in the chat so everybody knows where they are okay um, okay so that's background subtraction pluses and minuses but what I can say in a theater environment like we did for 16 revolutions where we had absolute control of the lighting we were using infrared lighting for that and so that was also controlled where we knew the camera wasn't going to move where we knew the background could be snapped at the beginning of the show and used for the rest of the show because the dancers were the thing that were changing on that stage it worked great for that so it's worth investigating and i wanted you to know how to do that particular thing yeah okay so um, that's basically it and the last thing it says about infrared tracking and what it does is I'm not doing anything actually I'm telling you to watch another video that we made so in 2016 at the very first Isadora Werkstatt we I gave it because so many people had been asking about this I did a workshop on how to do infrared tracking and it's all captured in that video in great detail all the techniques the cameras the way we did it and it's too much for today to get into but that video luckily already exists so if you're curious about that and the reason is well why is he talking about infrared tracking why is that important because when you're doing visuals and you're shooting those visuals into the same space you're tracking and they are visible light your tracking camera if it's a normal RGB camera will pick up the video that you're creating and it will start tracking it and basically it goes into a feedback loop and it doesn't work right what you need is a way to be able to track those people and then shoot video into it from your beam or a video projector and not have it uh, get captured and the thing that's lucky about video projectors is they don't produce light in the infrared spectrum they only produce visible light so if you can track with infrared light then you've got that light it's invisible to the human eye so you can't see it you do the tracking and then you can project right into that same space onto the performers or whatever or onto the public for that matter if you're tracking people in a public space 
you can project there and it will not be seen um, by the infrared camera that is capturing the, the scene for tracking. So I won't go further into that than to say go look at the video. The URL is shown there in the last frame. Go, uh, you can also copy and paste it by opening up that text box there. Should have put it into a comment. But anyway, go there and watch that video and you'll get a whole lot more information. And it also uses eyes to do the work. So you'll see that in action. So that's really a great extension of this uh, guru session. So now we're at the end. I am willing to take a couple of, if someone has a quick wish that they would like to see me do something or something that I didn't seem to cover, I'm happy to cover it. Now is your chance to post your questions while we take another deep breath and celebrate equality and justice and being good to each other and learning about what we didn't know before. That's a good thing to take a deep breath on today, on June 18th. So I'm just going to wait here for a moment and if I see something pop up there that you'd like to know about. You can always post your questions in the comments here. It's kind of cool if you post them here sometimes because comments help our videos get seen by others. Yeah. And it's also great to post them in the forum. There's a link inside of the description here of a forum post. You can ask questions there of something that I missed or you didn't understand or that you need clarification on. All right. Um, so mm, there, there's the, they, there they come. There they come. What about zone tracking? Oh, that's good. Zone tracking. Uh, <laughs> we do a duet with any. Oh, well, you know, I think you'd prefer to see her dance um, uh, over me, but male, maybe, who knows? Maybe you'd like to see me dance. I don't know. Zone, that's a really good, that's a really good thing. Let me see if I can cover that in a hot second here. Let me go We're all the way back to the beginning. Brightness tracking position. Yeah. I'm just going to copy and paste this at the very end. So this is like the very first scene. Uh, it was called brightness tracking position with the hand, right? So this is where we had to set the threshold and we had to set the number of objects. Yeah. Um, uh, so there we go. So if, what if you want to know what zone it's in? The, the way to do that is to use a chopper actor. So here I'm going to take a chopper actor uh, and I'm going to chop this into 25%. Now you see that I am, it kind of looks like I'm zoomed in, but now the image is one quarter of the size. And then I'm going to move that over to the left and move it up so that I'm now seeing the top left corner of the image, right? Okay. Now I'm just going to do this briefly, uh, uh, Jean-Francois, so you get the idea. I should have probably gone deeper into it, but so I've chopped off the top left quarter, and this eyes plus plus actor is only tracking the top left quarter. Uh, quarter. Now I'll do over here. I'm gonna go 50. Let's just say minus 50. It doesn't really matter what the number is. It just needs to be like this. So I say horizontal position minus 50, uh, plus 50 now, and still the vertical position minus 50. So now the first eyes plus plus is tracking the top left corner. And the second one is tracking the top right corner, right? So basically, by chopping the frame, using a chopper actor to chop the frame into four quadrants, I now have four, uh, four eyes plus plus actors that are tracking four separate areas. I don't know. I hope that sort of makes sense. Um, I wish I could make... Let me, oh, here, let's do the dancer maybe. Maybe that's more clear. Um, or... The hand dance duet, let's do that. Maybe that'll be a bit more clear because we'll have more hands in there. Yeah. No, not so good. Let's try, let's try number six. No, that's not going to work because of the background subtraction. Let's try number one, the dancer, just to see if maybe that helps us. No. That's not a very good example I'm giving you, I'm afraid. Let me do the other quadrants. Uh, 
Um, I'm afraid, I, since I wasn't prepared for this, I'm not going to do a terribly good job, Jean-Francois, but maybe that starts to give you the idea of what I'm talking about, about separating the image into four separate quadrants, but I just don't see anything here. Oh, goodness. Sorry, trying quickly to see if I can get it. Yeah, I think I set the values wrong. OK, let's try this. Maybe this will work. Can you sort of see that we're getting different areas of the frame? Maybe you can kind of see that now in those three eyes plus plus actors. By using the chopper actor and getting a top left, top right, you know, you can make it any size you want and focus in on any area of the image you want, and then you will only track in that area. To give me some feedback there, Jean-Francois. Does that kind of give you a place to start with that? I think I need to prepare better to really make a great example of that. I should have thought of that. That's a really great question. Um, there was a module that used to used a blob target. Is that still in the mix? We gauge depth with eyes plus plus. Um, the blob he's talking about blob target proximity. Um, yeah. So basically, what this does is this sets a point in inside of the frame, and it tells you how close the center of the blob is to that target, right? Um, that's also something that I didn't prepare today and it deserves a good example. So let me, I think we maybe need to do a second session for a couple of these advanced ideas because it's cool that you're interested. But suffice to say that you, you establish that there's one or more targets and you might have one at 23.5 and one at 48.5%, uh, right? And it's say it's 19.4, a circle that that's that big. If that blob comes close to that, it will tell you. Uh, sorry, if any blob, because you put in this other output, the blob list. All right, but you know what? That's too complicated to get into. I'm just going to confuse people. Let's come back to this. Let's do another session on that, okay? Um, uh, so, uh, how is it with the eyes actor column and row? Yeah, I mean, that, that actor, I mean, you can set a column and row, and the idea is if the blob hits that column or row, it will trigger. But it's kind of like a bit hit and miss whether that works or not. I can't actually, that was how I did it originally. It was kind of like there was another piece of software I saw that did something similar. I can't recommend that as a method, actually, because I didn't find it to be terribly reliable. This blob target proximity is much more interesting because as you get closer, the value goes up. So it's kind of like not just on and off, but it tells you, are you within a range of a point? That's one worth investigating. We can also try and make an example to post on the forum about that, yeah? Um, okay. Okay. All right. It's uh, 7.30, that's an hour and a half. Let's try and finish up. I hope that these last couple of things, I, I'm sorry that I wasn't more prepared for that, but hopefully it gave you a couple clues on what to do. And like Graham saying, he's happy to help people with this in the forum because he's a master of it. So we've got a few people that can help. Let's dig into this on the forum or you can post questions in the chat on, on the YouTube, you know, kind of like get some like action happening in the comments. That's always good for us. Uh, hint, hint. And, um, but anyway, I'm so glad to see you all here again. It's always great to share my knowledge with you. And um, so I want you to know that we won't be doing another one for another two weeks. We'll be back uh, whatever two weeks from today is. So uh, there's just a lot going on with other stuff that I have to do. But I hope that this will keep you busy for a little while. Remember, Facebook, Instagram, comments down below, forum, join us everywhere and just mostly go out and figure out a way to use this tracking stuff to make something that is going to make people think and learn and seek equality for everyone, especially on this special day. All right, so that's what I'm going to do for today. I thank you for being here again and I will see you 
at the next guru session if I can say goodbye no I can't I can't do it it's impossible now I'm gonna really do it bye